which basically means that it had some experience in kind of working with consciousness and exploring psychedelics, especially psilocybin mushrooms for their benefits and, and properties of transformation. And, um, so yeah, we, we met in Portland. We both uh, kind of collided. She came from San Diego. I came from Michigan and lived downtown in the Pearl. And we had a cross, we had a connection around uh, psychology and psychotherapy and uh, transformation and consciousness uh, coming at it from kind of different angles, but the same core philosophies and principles. And so we had a lot of great dialogue early on, thought that uh, that would be a shared um, kind of trajectory for the both of us. And it became our, our private practice. We do we have a, a program that we run. We had a private practice where we saw uh, clients and whatnot. And um, in that time frame, we uh, was kind of hadn't explored the space of the psilocybin mushroom in a good long time. And having moved to Portland, I didn't really know a lot of people yet. And got to thinking, well, don't people grow mushrooms? And, because uh, the last time I was doing, uh, looking into kind of having that experience, it was with people I knew that were uh, friends and stuff like that. And I thought, well, why don't we, why don't we try to grow these little guys and have the experience ourselves? And we picked the best ones for us and you'll find out why. <laughs> yeah, we, so we, yeah, we grew a batch of uh, golden teachers, a uh, cubensis mushroom. And of course we, Took a few rounds with that in cultivation and learned how to do that and uh, had a good flush at, at one point and figured out how to do it essentially. And so we had these golden teacher mushrooms and we started uh, um, experiencing those together, which really kind of took our thinking and our relationship into new and interesting directions. And we really. And can I say, in, in the experience, it wasn't just the experience itself. It was the experience of growing them, of loving them, of watching them grow. It was really a very magical, yes. mystical, oh, full experience. Chicken. And it was the first time I had ever seen how mushrooms grow. And so I was so delighted to be able to see these precious golden teachers grow and then to to, to love them and then to consume Doesn't and, seem to and be. partake of them. Sure. And it was during that time, um, I had some vague awareness that, um, that research was happening around uh, psilocybin. Uh, and in, in that time frame, we're talking 2015, an article showed up in our feed uh, from the New Yorker. And it was by a guy named Michael Pollan. <laughs> you may know him. Uh, this was before his famous book, and it was an article called The Trip Treatment. The Trip Treatment. And it was really a precursor to his great book. And at this time, uh, kind of psychedelic research and looking at psilocybin as a therapeutic agent uh, was not really talked about a lot. You know, I think there's kind of deep roots to this um, topic. So some of you may remember the deeper history of uh, psilocybin as a David Langstaff. I think we've got Join someone. The meeting. I think we've got someone without mute on. So if, if you keep your mute on, I'm, if you've got background noise, that'd be awesome. Um, yeah. So so that trip treatment article really triggered our our brains and opened up opened us up to what was going on because it laid out the the research that was going on. And of course, Michael Pollan is such a fantastic author. He also uh, worked in the uh, testimonials of the subjects in the research. And by research, I'm talking about um, research in the last 10 to 15, now 20 years um, in, from great institutes like Johns Hopkins and NYU and UCLA and uh, the Imperial College of London. Now there's a whole bunch more, but those were the, uh, the first and of course, there's a deeper history in the 50s and 60s, and I can we can talk about that in a little bit. But in this second kind of renaissance of, of research, those are the, the institutes that were 
leading the way. And, and one of the things that like really inspired us when we read the trip treatment is we help people for a living. That's what we do. We help them help themselves. And it's a not easy talk therapy to help an individual help themselves. And you have to be very conscientious to not be a fixer because that's not what people in therapy need. And so one of the great things about this article was that it talked about the therapeutic modality in which these clinical studies were being conducted. And it really resonated with us. And it, there was a, a, just this moment of, this is kind of what we've been looking for because we have so many clients that just really need perspective. Mm -hmm. And one of the beautiful things about psilocybin therapy is that what we discovered, what I discovered, what Tom had known for a, a bit longer than me mm -hmm. was that um, in psilocybin therapy, you are your own therapist, you do your own work. And the person who is there facilitating the experience they're just there to make sure that you stay safe and calm and that your experience is the best experience it possibly can be. And of course, there's much more to it and we'll talk more, more about that as well. But that for me was like, uh, this is exactly what we need where people can have an ego death experience and come back to the real world and find a new way of thinking. And so that was the trip treatment yeah, I kind of really focus the um, revolutionary aspect of this as a therapeutic intervention, which is that it's based on an experience, right? And it's an experience put in a therapeutic context, meaning there's preparation uh, beforehand, there's uh, kind of an intake process and a, a development of intent and a kind of assessment for goodness of fit. And that goes for, um, you know, assessing potential contraindications, people who probably shouldn't do this. There's a few, uh, but also, and maybe more so goodness of it in relation to developing a relationship with the facilitator. So there's a lot of comfort going into the experience because the psilocybin experience is certainly a profound and vulnerable experience. And that's why it's really important to have a, a facilitator that can, uh, create an affirming environment for this to unfold and for, to allow someone to really let go and, and uh, let the medicine do what it does, which is kind of take you to where you need to go. And this is why, uh, you know, another aspect of why this is so different than say a pharma <laughs> intervention, right? Uh, it's experiential. It works in a lot of different ways because it helps you get in touch with yourself. So if you're blocked in some specific way, that's where we're, you're gonna find the work. If you're not particularly blocked, then you find a, a, a kind of creative growth experience. So there's, there's always something to find in, in this modality. And it's just very different than, you know, certainly different than a pharma-driven approach where you're you know, taking a pill each day to kind of tweak brain chemistry, uh, you know, with that, at that kind of sub threshold level, you don't experience it. Um, so it's really therapeutic modality rather than a kind of medical, medical pharma modality. And, and so that really like, captured us yeah, I think, too. That as was therapists. really, really important to Tom and I because we see therapy as, as therapy. It's not in the, med, the, the predominant dominant medical model of, of medicine. It, sometimes medicine is used to help facilitate healthy talk therapy, but it's an experience, whether there's in medicine involved or not. Therapy is an experience. Yeah, there, there's a place for pharma, conventional pharma uh, interventions, and a lot of our clients benefit from you know, antidepressants and things like that. But this is a, a, a different approach and a, a beneficial approach, and we should have all those tools in the toolbox and we'll get to kind of the initiative as to what our inspirations are, certainly. Well, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the initiative. When we had read the trip treatment and we were really sparked on the inside to do some personal uh, diving and so that I could understand a little bit more about it, we really thought about how can we make this 
be a part of reality in the, in the world of psychotherapy, in the world of therapy. And we decided that we were gonna take a little trip to Mount Rainier and we were gonna have a consultation with the mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's back up for a second. So we read this article <laughs> and we were uh, really, we, after we read the, after, you know, I read the article, I said, you gotta take a look at this. We started having dialogue, right? Because we were both intrigued. And I remember Sri, you know, saying that, man, what if we could, it's such a shame we can't use this in practice. It's, wouldn't it be great to kind of develop this? I wonder if we should get involved with this some way. We started thinking about that. And then the ballot initiative idea kind of came. And it really was kind of like a, like <laughs> a little bit like lightning in a bottle, you know? It was like, whoa. <laughs> because you know why? Because we felt the responsibility of that idea right away. It was, um, well, the first thought I had was, well, someone's probably thinking about this already. So I got online, looked around, nothing, just crickets. There's absolutely nobody in the, there was no such thing as psychedelic policy reform just at that time. Just the clinical studies. That there was clinical the studies. There was action at the FDA pro, uh, level, but no state-based or city-based uh, policy reform efforts. And so that brought up lots of good questions and it brought up a certain responsibility because we we know ourselves that if we make a decision like if we're really going to do this we're going to like really do it that's just we we're kind of strong-willed people mm -hmm. and so we don't take that lightly and more importantly we don't take lightly the impact mm -hmm. and the, the potential and what this means in a bigger wider context and it means a lot you know it's really uh talking we're really talking about kind of entering into the mental health care system and shifting uh potentially shifting it um and, and we were looking like for clarity we knew that the, are we are we still on we knew that we were um we had this this calling this motivation after really looking around and and discovering that it actually was a possibility to do a ballot measure for the state. And that, as Tom said, was just a really heavy, heavy responsibility. And we had to really think about it. And so we did go to Mount Rainier and we packed we had, up the car and said, up the car. let's let's consult the mushroom on this topic because you know why not? We had all these extra, uh, we all had all these extra uh, golden, golden teachers, right? So we were already in that space a little. It's not like we were doing them a lot, but like periodically we'd check in with these mushrooms and you know so yeah. why not right so we got in the car went to Mount Rainier the base of Mount Rainier and we um, started a beautiful campfire and we just decided what is our intention yeah. because part of the process of discovering what you need to discover is setting an intention mm -hmm. and so for many people the intention is mm -hmm. I want to quit smoking or I need to quit drinking, or I'm been, I've been diagnosed with a terminal illness and I'm scared to die. I need to overcome that fear. And so the, the beauty of this therapeutic model that includes psilocybin is that you set this intention. And when you set this intention, you're gonna get exactly what you need. It may not be what you thought you're going to get, but it's always exactly what you need. And so we had set our camp up, we'd got everything ready and we, we put our arms together and we said, oh, okay, are you ready? And now remember, I'm, I'm, I'm not real experienced with this. And so I was in the beautiful setting. Mom and I were just, intentions were pure and, and we did. And, and our intention to be specific was to gain clarity on if we should move forward with a ballot initiative we have no idea how to do that, by the way. We're not politicians. We've never done a ballot initiative before. But we are people who figure stuff out, and we have a certain skill set that I think kind of fit. Um, so we were, we felt like there was something there. Yeah. And so we took it to the woods, and we, <laughs> we, um, we had a big uh, experience. And I remember sitting over the campfire. It's very hard to explain an experience. I'm not going to try. But what I can say is that the space of our thinking kind of 
uh, widened, widened out, you know, instead of thinking five years down the line, we all are thinking um, a thousand years wide, you know, and like, what does this really mean? And a lot of great thoughts came up, some of which we talked about in later, later talks as, as we got going. Um, for example, I thought about like, what are, what are the historians of the distant future going to uh, reflect? look at when they consider our era right like what what's important what's important right now what are they going to think about us and i got to thinking well they're not going to really care about our stupid politics or our even our technology i think what's going to jump out to historians if i mean literally a thousand years from now like so we'd be the primitive people right is that we undervalue our consciousness you know we uh, it really became clear that going inward and understanding the kind of roots of our own consciousness is kind of the last frontier. And that's where uh, our healing comes from. Essentially, we have just kind of miraculous energies within us that we don't really understand. We see this as therapists because sometimes you facilitate a healing experience and it's not the therapist that does it. It's a cathartic experience of change. Sometimes it happens all at once. Sometimes it takes longer. But you get an inkling that there are healing energies within it. Just like we heal our body when we get hurt, the body knows how, what to do. The, the psyche and the spirit have wisdom and intelligence and we creativity and all kinds of things. We, don't even, we haven't even tapped it, really. And so we don't often know how to tap it. And it's, it's not an easy thing to figure out. What is my consciousness? What is consciousness in general? What, is it, what does it mean to transcend? What does it mean to have a sense of sacredness? What does it mean to feel the awe of the mysteries of the cosmos that we live in when we're so focused on our day-to-day -day practices that we forget to look up yeah, all and we that's... forget to look in and we forget to look down? And all that comes rush comes uh, magically clear when you're you know in this in the middle of a psilocybin experience and we're kind of in that space and then it is thinking in in that context and then we're, well this is important in that way and then you blurted out at someone we were totally internal at this point we weren't really talking we we're just kind of in our own spaces well, we and then we started to come come down just enough to where we could communicate. Yeah, every, a little bit. A little bit. Oh, and, and I remember because we went into this with intention and, and we had just now come to a, should we do it? And we decided, yeah, we should do it. And I looked at Tom and I said, we're pregnant now. Mm -hmm. And it was just this magical, beautiful experience that what is now called measure 109 is our love child, our baby. Mm -hmm. And so, for Tom and I to be able to have this desire, we are so inspired to address the mental health crisis that we have in our, our state, actually in our, in our world. But we knew we could start right where we were. And we didn't know how we were gonna go about it, but we had affirmation that it was something that we were supposed to be doing. And we knew that the mental health crisis in Oregon was definitely in 2015, very, very bad. And now it's just exponentially worse, uh, in, especially because of COVID and what we have going on politically. Yeah. And so we, we wanted to address this mental health crisis. Yeah, yeah so just to, so we made the decision and we, we met later, a little bit later in life. So we don't have the opportunity to have a child ourselves. Yeah, and so that's we, why I said that. So it was really kind of meaningful to like, think about raising this in, with the same kind of attention that we would a child and we kind of have. And just like a child, it grows up and like gets away from you, <laughs> you have to like let it go. Uh, so we're kind of in that process now. But we wanted to care for this idea and protect the spirit of what we were trying to do and not let it get, you know, kind of off track and all that good stuff. And so we made, so we decided we would do it. And in so doing, we kind of defined what our inspirations were because you could just wait and see what happens 
kind of on the federal level, although nothing has ever happened on the federal level with Not even quickly. cannabis. <laughs> but there's a lot of promising progress uh, in terms of turning psilocybin into a more conventional kind of medicine. But we had a particular inspiration to um, make sure that psilocybin therapy found its proper ground in the culture. Like it's really important to us like how this is integrated into society. And we've spoken a little bit about that already, this idea of a therapeutic model rather than a purely medical model. We wanted to uh, provide a way for people to access these services regardless of diagnoses or qualifying conditions. So anyone should be able, who can safely benefit should be able to access these experiences. So that's a kind of key point in our initiative that you wouldn't get through other channels. Um, and also the fact, if, if Tom had alluded to this earlier, but if you think of a doctor, a doctor can help fix a broken bone, but a doctor can't help fix a broken spirit. And so we understand therapy in that fashion that the human being who comes into a therapeutic environment is looking to heal a little wound that they might have, or perhaps just a generally broken spirit. And so it was our motivation to make sure that this stayed out of the dominant medical pharma-based model, but included it to a degree. Yeah, I wouldn't say, yeah, I would say that medical oriented folks are more than invited to to certainly Absolutely. be involved in this it's not an exclusive thing it just i don't think that the strict medical model should be the dominant uh dominant model when it comes to issues of uh, psycho spiritual development and and therapy more generally so that was one uh motivation was to kind of find move this advance this to it into its proper container um and then also, yeah, just being aware that uh, Oregon particularly has a, a mental health crisis. We have the worst rates of mental illness in the entire country. And like Cherie was saying, I would say the entire country has a bit of a crisis and we're, we're, we're the worst of it. So there's a real need for uh, new therapeutic options yeah. in Oregon. So that was very much on our mind as well as, as therapists, we uh, kind of understand the mental health landscape and see what the needs are yeah so we so we moved forward and we always uh focused on 2020 right from the beginning 2015 we laid out a 2020 ballot measure so this I think campaign that is to us through that through that experience that we had on the golden features like that yeah. number came to us 2020 was like that was going to be the election year that we would shoot for it always felt like this kind of weird inflection point we had no idea this was even before uh 2016. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it was laughs> so we'll just leave that there so <laughs> no, we had no idea that, that you know how, how much of an inflection point it would be but yeah. to have this in the mix uh, for 2020 is pretty interesting yeah and so it's it's 440 so we'll move a little bit more quickly so what we did at that point is we came home and we knew we we were on a mission now and when Tom and I get on a mission, we get on a mission. And so the first thing we did is we made contact with the, le the legislative council and we asked them, do you help with people just with ba these ballot measures? And so they are located in Salem and they said, yes, we do. And we shared with them what our thoughts were and we made an appointment with them and we dialogued with them. And so we created a draft. We on the science-based kind of modality, created a licensing structure, a sequence of sessions, basically following the science in terms of what this is going to look like. Um, and we started a, a society, the Oregon Psilocybin Society, which is basically a nonprofit uh, coalition of those who support this measure, as well as uh, a kind of educational wing for psilocybin therapy uh, more generally. So we got the gears going in that way, started to do events and uh, get the word out. Meanwhile, that draft was taken to the Legislative Council and we worked on, plugged away at that. That became more, um, more and more refined and became a full draft. In so the Legislative Council, by the way, is a, is a body of lawyers that 
drafts bills for Congress in Oregon. So they're like a nonpartisan body that just does the mechanics of drafting bills. And so they work with ballot measures uh, when you approach them with a bunch of signatures. And we did that, so we were the first. To and that was a two year process, by the way. Yeah. From the time that we came down off the mountain and we worked on what we felt needed to be the major components of the measure itself, which uh, we're gonna talk about here in a minute, to the time when we got a first uh, opportunity to submit it to the Secretary of State for approval. That was a two-year process. That's almost a three-year process, I think. Yeah. And so we were doing more outreach, more events. They got bigger. They kept selling out. We were always amazed that there was so <laughs> much enthusiasm for the idea. And we, the coalition started to develop. We did some bigger events. We hooked up with Paul Stamets, did events at the Newmark. That kind of put us on the map on a new level. Uh, we finished the draft, went through a ballot titling process, started gathering signatures. So a ballot measure, as you guys probably know, you have to gather uh, a bunch of signatures, like in our case, 150,000, it turned out. And so we started that process. And then, you know, this is going back a few years still. And then I got a call from uh, a lawyer named Dave Kopelak, who's since become a good friend and heads up the Emerge Law Group downtown Portland. And he said, I didn't know him at the time. He said, well, could you come in and do you think we could talk about this measure? I'd love to talk to you about it. So I go in. Join uh, the meeting. Up in this high rise in downtown Portland, go up to the top floor, looking over the city and Mount Hood in this conference room. And I'm like, oh boy, what's this about? Yeah, it like, was like serious. amazing, the serious stuff. And so he comes in and He's with Sam Chapman, who's now our campaign manager. And he's like, I really love this bill. You guys are doing a fantastic job, but I'm really scared about what's gonna happen when it passes, uh, because I don't feel like it has the legal protections after it rolls out. Like if it passes, you know, what about the feds and what about the state officials? And is it really gonna roll out? Um, and of course, you know, we're therapists. We had thought through all the therapy, the modality, but we didn't necessarily think through those details. It didn't really, it wasn't really, I mean, I knew that that was a potential issue, but he knew exactly what needed to happen. Well, and he said, I got him. And we were, de we were depending on the legislative council for most of our council. So this was, he was like just a, 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 a gift in yeah. and of itself. It was a gift, but it was also, uh, my heart sank about three levels because he's like, we need to, it would be good to rewrite this. Uh, you can tell me to screw off, but you know, I really, really like to, it, you know, if you want to rewrite it, let me know. I'm like, oh boy. And cause we had already gotten started. And so I left and I was totally hesitant. I told you about it and we were totally hesitant to start over basically cause there's a whole process. And then around that same time, some other, the uh, Drug Policy Alliance gave us a call and they are this huge uh, nonprofit uh, powerhouse behind all the cannabis legislation across the country. Um, and they're like, so we're starting a new, you know, our post cannabis agenda is, is broad based uh, kind of decriminalization of all drugs and moving toward a Portugal style, Portugal -style uh, public health based approach to drug use. And so we're wondering if uh, we're looking at, we're, we're looking at Oregon, we're going to do our first campaign there and, and move forward on that. And we notice you have this decrim, decriminalization component in your measure. What do you think about dropping that and getting behind a full comprehensive decriminalization measure? Uh, and of course that was like, Yes, absolutely. Because when you think about it, to to just work on decriming just psilocybin, it's a disservice to the the other people who need help. You know, um, particularly the underserved uh, populations uh, that are predominantly the ones who go to jail for small possession of drug use. And so we were very thoughtful and very interested and it was a big decision yeah so like just to be clear like there's psilocybin therapy requires like a legal framework 
And then decriminalization means reducing penalties for common possession of, of drugs. So it's a little bit of a different lane and they, they're, combat, they're compatible, but they're different. And the DPA, Drug Policy Alliance, has all this firepower and knowledge and wisdom around the big social issues that connect to decriminalization, like uh, prison overpopulation and social injustice issues and all that kind of stuff. Huge stuff that they were just way better at and more their focus where we could focus on creating a little bubble for psilocybin therapy. Of course, the DPA was talking about um, decriminalizing decriminalizing psilocybin as well. So that would still be in, in their law. Um, so long story short, we decided to do a revision, worked with uh, Emerge Law Group, revised the entire bill, uh, well, wrote the, the, the therapeutic modality, stayed exactly the same, dropped the decrim, added a two-year development period, added an, adv an advisory board component uh, that would you know, reach out to state and federal officials to create an uh, environment of cooperation so that this thing could roll out in the best possible way, really. Uh, and, and we created the best possible measure we could. And, and it was hard and it was, um, it was scary because we knew we had to start the whole process again with the, getting the signatures and then getting the state to approve it and then getting the S Secretary of State to give us a new ballot title and that in and of itself is a process, let me tell you, but we won't bog you down with that. And so we did some more fundraising uh, events, which was really fun. We got Dr. Robin Carhart Harris to come out and speak with uh, Mark Hayden of MAPS Canada. And we just started really talking uh, a lot about this to the community. And we did some, um, we added some protections into the new draft that kept a, a, a safeguard against corporate influence in big pharma. So it was really important <laughs> to have that opportunity. And it was actually a good move. And so just for your knowledge, measure 110 is what was uh, at the time the DPA was talking to us about. Yeah. At that time, here's, here's the, the mm -hmm. final kind of like miracle that I was like sharing, the, the miracle of magic and then madness of a, a campaign is Dr. Bronner's Magic Soaps contacted us and they pledged support. And in that moment, it became very, very real. And that was in August of 2018, no, 2019. Mm -hmm. 2019. Yeah. Yeah. And we knew that, okay, this is it. And they, um, Dr. Bronner's, if you don't know who they are, just let me share with you that they have so, they do so much beautiful work. They um, have the steward of the earth, regenerative, regenerative farming, fair pay, and fair trade initiatives, as well as they give and support psychedelic medicine work. Uh, David Bronner and the Bronner family pledged uh, quite a lot of money to this campaign. They give to MAPS. They are uh, supporting of so many different things, but not just psychedelic medicine. They care about what they call our space planet spaceship planet earth so we just love dr bronner's yeah so we relaunched we did another big event with paul stamets we hired staff we hired oh, stamets <laughs> yeah we, we worked with paul a lot he's on our advisory board we set up an advisory board with paul and francois bordezat and a few other uh, great folks around the world um the campaign just became a real campaign and we had a huge volunteer base um, and everything was sailing yeah. so smoothly. And then guess what happened? COVID. COVID. Yeah. We, no. had, we had already, we had hired a signature gathering firm to kind of go with our volunteer force. We had gathered a hundred thousand signatures in just a few months, just incredibly. And we were, we, we were sailing toward uh, getting on the ballot and then COVID hit and we still needed what? 50,000 more. 50,000 more signatures. And uh, there's no way to get them, you would think. And, and it killed ballot initiatives across the country. Yeah, it did. Well, and so the way that one get, got onto the ballot was dynamically changed. Yeah. You had one, uh, we, we had to rethink everything. And thank goodness that we have an amazing staff 
our executive council, our, our campaign manager, they just made it happen. And they got us to the finish line mm -hmm. in terms of getting on the ballot. Yeah, and once too. we got on the ballot, then we saw that new, new big donors jumped in and the finances were coming in. The polling uh, was looking good. It's really extremely close. And so education is super key. So the money that we've been raising over the last six months has been towards education because when you tell somebody about the initiative, that if they're on the, the, the um, fence, if you give them just a little bit of information about what it is and what it isn't, the, the rate of acceptance goes up very, very high. And so believe it or not, it costs millions and millions of dollars to run TV ads, to have, edit, to, to have the editorial board meetings, to put out um, all kinds of stuff on different social media for, forms. So it's very expensive to have. This is the madness part of the campaign and it happens fast. You're just go, go, go. And we're right in the thick of it. That brings us up to, you know, today we got the TV ads running. We've got, uh, you know, a great campaign team working on all cylinders. We're right in the thick of it. We really don't know what's going to happen on election day. It's going to be close. You know, we're still, we still have work to do. And I would plead to everyone out there who's willing to support to go to the website and get connected because we're doing phone banks and get out to vote. And all of that stuff is right at play. So our lives are crazy right now. It's a good crazy, but we're, we're pushing to the finish line. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of, I guess, wrap it up. You know, this um, modality, this, this is therapeutic access to psilocybin therapy is just, um, it's gonna help a lot of people. It's gonna save lives. And it's also gonna mean something culturally yeah. You know, it's um, it's kind of like reclaiming something that was lost. Reclaiming our, our the value that we should have of ourselves that we don't have. Reclaiming our consciousness, understanding that everything we need is inside of us. The experience that we need to have, it, it resides inside of us. And that we need to value ourselves more, to value the the fact that we exist and the place where we exist and the opportunities we have as human beings. Can you talk about the modality part? I mean, how it, how, what, how it works and yeah. how, the whole thing around the psilocybin. And I know people are very curious about that part. Yeah. Yeah. So what's on the ballot is um, access to ther psilocybin therapy, therapy using psilocybin. So when we say psilocybin therapy, we're talking about a sequence of sessions in a licensed facility by a practitioner that's uh, been trained to do specifically this kind of work. So not just any old, not a psychiatrist necessarily, not someone who's trained for psilocybin assisted uh, facilitation. So what would happen is, is you would uh, go through a little process to uh, be Screen. assessed and screened to make sure you're a good fit for this kind of Therapy. And that has to do with that there are some, not a lot, but there are some real contraindications. You want to know what medications uh, won't kind of mix well with this. Um, and there are a few other. I think people with a history of psychosis, for example, are not good candidates. And we can talk about why if we need to. But, um, so there's some risks, but with careful screening, it's easily kind of identified. Go through that process. You develop rapport with a facilitator. And then like a few days later, you have the psilocybin administration session. Okay. So that's where you that's are. That's going to be done in a licensed service center. Right. And that's very important. These will not be in neighborhoods where, or near schools. No one under 21 will be able to have access to this type of therapy because we, we just don't know enough about the brain. We, you know, we've got to protect the, the youth for sure. And we know that, as you guys probably very well know, that psilocybin is, is anti-addictive. It's, it's not toxic. You can't overdose on it. So that we have that going for but us. It, but it is, but a, it is a very huge, big experience. And it requires a very trained individual with a lot of, a lot of learning under their belt. Not necessarily a psychiatrist, psychologist, psychotherapist. 
but it is really important that an individual is really trained. So you have your administration session and then you, within what, four to six hours, you wanna finish up? Yeah, and, and that's a really inward session. It's not like a lot of talk, talk. it's more just putting on eye shades and going inward and letting yourself have this experience. And then a couple of days later, you know, you bring that to a close. Nobody's driving home while still under any influence. We're super careful about all that. All this is happening at a licensed facility. And then a couple of days later, you start an integration session. And that's more of like an active talk session to kind of um, talk about the insights and epiphanies or breakthroughs, anything that came up during the experience that you want to talk through with the idea of turning that into a mental health plan and bringing that into a practice. And that's what helps people change. And that's what the research shows uh, creates lasting change. And I'd like to add to that, in the, the, the therapeutic environment, it, it's gonna be different. It's gonna be each person who takes on a, a license to be a facilitator or a license to be a service center. Service centers are gonna look different. They're not all gonna be cookie cutter, gentle dental service centers. They're going to look different. People are gonna be able to practice this type of therapy with their license, but creating their own environment. And environment is very, very important to the individual. The rapport is important and environment is important as well as set the setting of intentions. Yeah, so the key regulations are around safety, practice standards and ethical standards and the Oregon Health Authority has oversight in that way, but the environments themselves uh, will, could be clinical, could be a retreat center, could be a more ceremonial kind of environment. So that's really left open to the practitioners to decide. I saw a question so there the about... question was, how is the training gonna take place? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a two year development period that is written into the law should be passed, measure one on yes, on November 3rd. Um, and during that two years, Oregon Health Authority is charged with developing a, an advisory board. The advisory board is going to consist of psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists, botanists, uh, my, mycologists, just a, a, a wide range of experts. And then what we'll do is we'll, the first thing we hope that will happen, Tom and I will be on that board because we wrote that into the law. <laughs> But we, we are hoping that the very first thing we address is training. And so training, how exactly it's going to be done? Is it going to be in person? Is it going to be online? That's yet to be determined. It won't be online, all of it. Not all of it, yeah. It, the training, will, the training will be intensive, and it will be open to anyone who has the heart to do this kind of work. It's not based on... Uh, based only on prior credentialing. There may be aspects of of this therapeutic context that require medical oversight. But we also think it's important that there's opportunities for people to get involved who, who have uh, that, that disposition and, and that discipline to do that intensive training. So we're open to more questions, guys. That's about what we had to share with you yeah. and we'd love to answer some more. So the question is, where do you get the psilocybin? Great, great question. So the, the framework is based on a, a few different licensees, and one license is for the cultivation of psilocybin. Uh, and so th that will be an open application process. Of course, there'll be some standards around, um, you know, making sure we have good uh, standardized products. Uh, they can be mushrooms, you know, it's not going to be like exclusively synthetic. We wrote that into the initi initiative uh, intentionally because we want for those facilitators who want to approach uh, these services that way and use the mushroom itself or an extraction from the mushroom. It's we important. think that's, that's it's important, important to note also that there will be quality control. So that's part of the Oregon Health yeah. Authority is that, that they make sure that the product is safe. Yeah. And so the natural product or an extract or synth synthesized, we don't, you know, that's gonna be up to the producer that uh, asks for a license from the state. Yeah, so it'd basically be an application process with the Oregon Health Authority to become a licensed producer of psilocybin for the program. So it's really circumscribed. In other words, we're only trying to meet the need, the therapeutic need, and those products, if you want to call them products, 
won't be branded or marketed to the general public. It's just to fulfill the need of practitioners in this space. Yeah. I bet many of you are wondering about the cost. So in the, in the initiative, we wrote that when after this two year development period takes place, we want it to be budget neutral. So the cost of the licenses will, will be what it costs to run the program. So we don't anticipate it being exorbitant in any way like that. And I know a lot of people worry about that, but we were really sensitive to making equitable access, not only to the individuals who want the service, but to the individuals who want to participate in one of these or all three of these licenses. So the question is, how do you measure or control the dosage for a person? That's a good question. Yeah, and it's a little bit beyond my uh, scientific expertise. expertise, but what I can tell you is that'll be a great uh, topic for the advisory board. And we are gonna, you know, when you are writing the initiative, you don't identify exactly who's gonna be on the advisory board, but you identify what disciplines will be involved and what they will be involved in and there will be mycologists on that advisory board. I know Paul Stamets has voiced interest in being on the board, um, but it will be appointed by the Oregon Health Authority. So they will work on figuring out how to uh, ensure quality products that are um, uh, standardized in terms of dosage. And I know there's a lot of good technology around even the organic product, you know, extracting in such a way that you can get uh, uh, evenly dosed products. Even the natural, if you, if you think of what cannabis can do that with how much THC is in, in a certain amount of, of cannabis, you, we should be able to see that happen with psilocybin as well. So exactly how much dosage it's going to be is going to be something that the advisory board as a whole will work on. Yeah. Any more questions? Just ask or just unmute. So do you, have you done this with other, have you done this uh, as a session with someone? Yeah, I, mean, no, I mean, I don't legally, I don't want to add, you know, put you on the spot. I just meant, you know, personally, you've talked about your own. So I thought maybe you've done it as a, a trial thing to how it would work for you. No, we, we do not. And there is a healthy underground and there has been for a long time. Long time. Um, our interest was really in the science. You know, we were inspired to, to hear the testimony and see the outcomes from the, the different research programs. And during the course of this campaign, we've been privileged to talk with so many people who have gone through those trials and, and shared their experiences with us. So we are, really appreciative and kind of dialed into what's going on there, but no, we don't work it into our own practice. I know Michael Pollan talked about, um, you know, sort of the need for right, the, the you know, synthetic, he, he sort of seemed like in his book that he was promoting, you know, a real controlled amount and a kind of synthesized amount. And I thought that that was what you would be required to do in order to yeah, it's well, not it's not required. And I think Michael Pollan also he, he's conscientious. He wants to make sure that people understand that this is a vulnerable experience. And he was his that book that he wrote was, you know, around the clinical research. And they do they have to use uh, synthesize because they have to have exact measure control yeah, for the yeah. FDA regulations. And the regulations are strict. That's why it takes so long to get something through the FDA. But we know as a people that we can dose something correctly if we have quality control and if we make sure that the product is being cared for the way it needs to be cared for. Yeah. Well, what about the other measures that are having to do with you know, drug legalization? Is that going to help, help you in your efforts or is that going to get interfere with some people getting weirded out about other drugs and then they're just gonna say no to everything? What do you think? Well, wow, good, good question. I, politically, it's a little hard to say uh, how that's going to shake out. I think um, practically they're compatible. You know, if both pass, uh, they sit well with each other. We were allied with Measure 110 in terms of gathering signatures and things like that. It's totally separate campaigns, though. We don't, you know. There's going to be a little bit of fear, obviously. Change creates fear. 
But if we look at history and we look at what happened with Portugal, 20 years ago, Portugal decriminalized uh, for the entire country. And their addiction crisis has diminished so exponentially. And so it's a really, um, we believe it's a very good measure but we don't know, you know, how people are going to react one way or the other. We're just, we want to tell people what our measure is about. And it's about psilocybin therapy with a licensed and very trained facilitator in a very safe environment using a very clean and, and very well cared for product. I think the overlap is just the idea of moving toward a public health based approach to these compounds rather than a criminalizing approach. I mean, we should look at these through the lens of science. We should look at where they're helpful, where there's risks, and just be smart about it. I think we can, have mat we can mature enough as a society to look at these things uh, with some objectivity. And in the case of psilocybin, there are clearly uh, therapeutic benefits if we're, if we're approaching this in a smart way. So what do we have for questions out there? Please unmute yourself and ask questions or make a statement about, about I'd love to hear from uh, other folks that are attending. So. Um, I'd like to know um, what your, you know, contact information is, um, website, you know, things like that. Um, sure, let, let's let you know. It's, um, the website is voteyeson109.org. So that's voteyeson109.org. Okay. And our Facebook page is the same thing, vote yes on 109. Okay. Our Instagram, same, everything's the same across the board. Okay. And if you go to the website, you can find how to actually contact us, phone number, uh, mailing okay. address, all that good stuff. How yeah. to volunteer, how to donate, how to get involved. Even right now, we've got a volunteer um, call out for phone banking. We've got to get in touch with people who haven't heard about this measure between now and the next 20 days so that we can get people to vote yes on 109. And so we have a phone bank that um, actually David Bronner, uh, who is our largest uh, do donor, he is actually phone banking for measure 109. And he really inspires all of the um, volunteers to yeah. step that's, up. That's good. They're, they're wonderful people. They're, yeah. they're amazing. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Well, I think you're doing really great work, and you know, I'm I'm of the generation of Ram Dass and and um, dancing the Grateful Dead on mushrooms, you know, kind of thing. And I'm really <laughs> now that I've become you know older and and more inward, more spiritual. Um, I'm really interested in um, you know what this could be like in a more therapeutic, more conscious environment. It's really exciting. It's really it is very exciting. Keep up the good work. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Cynthia. And I really I think appreciate it. Somebody wanted us just to re to, to say where you could volunteer again. Just go to vote yes on 109.org O R G and there'll be a section, there'll be a tab that says it's probably really big. Uh, volunteer now. Yeah. And it's just put your email in or your phone number and they somebody will contact you within 24 hours from our campaign office. Okay. All right. Thank you guys so much. Oh, you're so Thank welcome. You, we are so thankful, you guys, that you took the time out of your day to come and learn more about Measure 109, learn about the spirit in which we birthed it. And now we have to turn it over to uh, our baby over out <laughs> into the world. And hopefully it will be accepted and we will see change come to Oregonians for now. And hopefully this will be a template that's used across the country and yeah, maybe even worldwide at some time. So I, I'm not trying to be, you know, put a, a damper on all of this, but what happens if you don't get it passed? What, what is your next move? Yeah, I mean, at very least we've, we've helped to start a conversation. I mean, I can't take any ownership because that, that movement has been coming together from so many angles. But I think Oregon, you know, played a real role in advancing the conversation, especially in terms of, uh, you know, taking bold action in terms of policy reform and uh, being able to set forth a potential template. So, you know, we haven't thought tons about, 
you know, if it doesn't pass, but I imagine that, you know, we have a template, we've developed a coalition, we know who our supporters are, we know who, you know, people like David and others who are um, supporting this, not only financially, certainly financially, but, you know, with David, for example, he's on our exec team, we talk to him almost every day, really, he's like so involved in our processes. Um, and so we have a strong coalition. So I don't think the conversation ends. That's like yeah, what I, I can tell you for sure. Yeah, I think that's the best sure. way to say it is that we're hoping that it passes, but there's a possibility that it doesn't. And if it doesn't, we have a strong coalition and we have a template. And so and we'll see. The, the idea is that what you said is that people get frightened about what all this could look like and what it means and it's changed. And it's like, I don't know about this and you know all yeah. the other things coming in. I'm, I, heard somebody say that it really did harm to your your issue to try to bring in all the le the legalization for f so many other substances that you well, know that's, not, that's, not, us. Focused on that. that's not us that, yeah. so that's so there's measure 109 and there's measure 110 we're measure right. 109 uh, 110 is yeah they they are you know they they're really focused on addiction services but they have this kind of uh, the, the philosophy behind it is moving toward a public health approach. Um, right. But that's, that does, you know, kick up lots of issues for people. It um, sometimes feels like maybe it is too much, but I'll let you know, we do polling and the polling is positive. People are ready for a change. They are. And I think oh, that yeah. we're really ready for a change when it comes to our mental health. And we are in a pandemic. We are the, worst rate of mental health and addictions in the whole United States. And, and Oregon is very progressive. So we, we think we're in a good place, but if not right now, then soon, right? Right. That's, right. That's great. We're in it to win it. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I, don't, I just was hoping that, you know, you've got enough, you know, the train's on the track, it's going. And so, you know, you, yeah. you may slow down a little bit, but it's not gonna stop moving in that direction. That's right. It's not That's gonna right. stop moving. Once, it, once it's going, it's going. And we started something in 2015, and we are going to see this now as something that begins to take place across our country. So does Michael Poland, did, have you talked with him? Yeah, we've talked with him a bit. We had coffee when he was here in Portland and we've had some email exchange. He's, as a author, he's kind of like objective and doesn't necessarily want to get into endorsements and things like that, but he's done everything but that in terms of helping us communicate our message. And he's getting he's people been great, to look yeah. at it and he mentions it and talks about it on, on his, his social media. Yeah. And he's an amazing man, by the way, just a really amazing man. And so... We have just a great coalition of supporters mm -hmm. to be in a better place in that regard. Yeah. We have healthcare workers, doctors, psychiatrists, psychotherapists. We have law enforcement. We have senators. We have congressmen that are endorsing Measure 109. So we're in a good place. And by the way, when we say we, we always mean like all, all of you. Like we always, this campaign is belongs to the people it's a reflection who support of all you guys yeah it belongs to the people that support it you know and uh that's what makes it so uh, just all consuming for us because of all the beautiful energy out there um people who even haven't even done psychedelics before get uh, connected to the campaign because it seems it seems to represent and resonate with uh core values you know uh, of health and progress and overcoming fear and things like that. And it just seems to have struck something. And yeah. It's, and it's beautiful. It is beautiful. You guys are beautiful. And we're so glad to be one with you. And we're so thankful for the time that you've given us today. We truly are. And if you could just do one thing for us, please, can you share Measure 109 with one person you know? Mm -hmm. Just one person. Let them know about it. Let them know that. It's psilocybin therapy in a regulated way, but it's not really the OHA. It's really about the therapists who are gonna be providing the, the services in a very safeguarded way. And if you could just share it with just one person, we can all, and, and ask them to share it with one person. We can see Measure 109 pass. I really do believe that we can see that happen. We're so close, it's unbelievable.
<laughs> it's it's right there. Yes. <laughs> I have a question. I see a question on the on the the chat there about um, whether these mushrooms are cooked before they're consumed because we cook most other edible mushrooms. Yeah. And uh, so. You no, know, typically they're. I mean, typically in a tea, you know, boiled or uh, in water and. The, that pulls out the psilocybin, um, but no, I don't think there's. They're typically I don't, cooked in that way. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think they're 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 the way that we're familiar with is either it's synthesized or it's a tea, or you just eat them dried. So, but I've seen people convert them into like gummies and things oh yeah like that. yeah there's, we have seen there's that. all kinds of ways that. There's going to be lots of uh, we've interesting seen, We've seen, ways we have to... a friend who told us that their, their partner made them psychedelic pumpkin cupcakes. <laughs> yeah, like I don't that. know what that's going to be like, but might, it ought to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions out there? I can't see the chat, if there is a chat. Yeah, it's red, it. it's red. Oh, there it is. Oh, here's a bunch of questions. What am I doing? Um, okay. There I am. I was couldn't get myself to unmute for some reason. I was just thinking, you know, that whole idea of, you know, people going out and hunting it. It's still illegal to have it in your possession, you know, and even though we're all on this, wanting this to happen, you know, we have to take the steps it's going to take to get it more, uh, you know, to get it legalized. And so that it always worries me when people, you know, hear this and really want to try it for themselves and really want to experience that and, and go out and, um, well, people are doing it. We know that already. Right? <laughs> they're already they're doing, doing it. They're it's already the, doing it. That's right. They're already doing it. And, um, it. what we're doing is we're just bringing some legality to, to their use in the therapeutic model. And people and, will do it on their own if, if they want to continue doing that. And we have absolutely no issue of that. We're not trying to move people out of their typical, you know, if you've found a level of comfort in your home and whatnot, and measure 110 will help with that just to remove like decrim, to decrim that. And that's, that's something, but right. this is really for a particular purpose, you know, and that's addressing, that's right. you know, the needs out there because some people really need help and they need that facilitation. And some people just prefer it, you know, for personal growth and it should exist. The, that infrastructure should exist. That should and, exist, right. I'm, I mean, just wondering the intensity of the dose, it sounded like from what, again, Michael Pollan was saying is that it needed to be a pretty heavy dose in order to get you to the level of change. Yeah. So right. that would be a real... Uh, and and then when you're on a big, strong dose like that, you are so fragile, you're in such a vulnerable state of mind. So it's wisdom. And if we look at the ancients and how we have seen this used in, in, by natives in the last hundreds of years, if not thousands, it's always done with great, great care. There's a deep respect and honor for the way that psilocybin is consumed. That's and we want, we want to hold that sacredness in this measure. That is the spirit and the heart of this measure. And we're hoping that instead of seeing in your mind, you know, like pharmacy type of thing or a medical office type of environment that you think of a sacred, spiritual, psycho-spiritual environment with where you, with which you will be able to explore your own consciousness and solve your own problems because that's okay. how we envision it. So I noticed Cynthia had written a, a, a question too, like what, what does a facilitator do if, if you're being facilitated, what is that? Yeah, it's, you know, the, the, the term holding space comes up a lot, it sounds simple, but there's a lot of nuance to being someone who does that well. You have to be someone who's managed to get your own stuff completely out of the way and not impose any of your own expectations on a session. You have to be able to deliver, you have to be able to create an environment that's affirming and comfortable and you have to be able to create rapport um, and you have to be able to be non-directive. In other words, you, you facilitate the therapeutic sequence 
but you don't uh, get out ahead of it. You don't impose anything upon it. You, uh, you, you allow help. them to have their experience. Yeah, it's just the art of facilitation. And so it's the again, same that therapy and talk therapy, it's the same way. You don't tell somebody what they need to think and you don't tell them what they need to do. You, you help them unravel it themselves. Well, you, in facilitating with, with, with psilocybin, what we've seen in the research, what Michael Pollan talked about in his book, is that that person who's holding space for you assures you that you're gonna be safe. They help you if you have a challenging experience by, in, by reassuring you that you're okay. And they are there just to ensure your safety. Yeah, and, and those challenging experiences are, you know, as real. a facilitator, you have to know how to maintain and have the knowledge of kind of how to manage um, uh, challenging experience. And challenging experiences are not uh, bad, bad things because if you think about, like, if you're going into a psilocybin session and you're someone who's struggling with addiction and you're looking for sobriety, well, think about addiction. It's kind of, you can look at it as there's an avoidance co component there. There's uh, often addiction is related to trauma that you're not processing. And so psilocybin allows a kind of mental flexibility to access trauma and that's, that's hard to do. But as a therapist, as therapists, we, it's kind of a, a, a basic tenant of therapy that you have to turn toward the anxiety rather than cover it up, run away from it, right? And psilocybin and any real therapeutic transformational process involves engaging with the difficult material. And uh, so that creates uh, an experience that may be challenging, but very productive and very therapeutic. Right. So a facilitator understands that and is able to uh, kind of navigate that, that and the, landscape the, the, the trained bit. facilitator will also be trained in the integration and the the preparation sessions so it's not just the sit the, the the holding space you have to be able to do from a to z and so that's that's what the training will consist of is what does a to z consist of and how does that work and how do we how do we do this how do we roll this out and how do we make it so that right. hopefully we get some federal participation you know, so that we feel during that two-year development period, we don't have to worry so much about um, how it rolls out. That's what that two-year development period is for state officials and federal officials to talk about this. And for and for practitioners to get training. You know, yeah, and that's there's and a lot to do. You asked about the veterans, and um, we we are we do work with Heroic Hearts. They're a veteran organization. We're like um, co coalition with them, right? We. Yeah, we have uh, several uh, vet um, organizations that are behind the measure. We also, uh, uh, yeah, Heroic Hearts is the main one, and Vets is another one. Just I forget what it stands for. Um, and yeah, we have veterans who actually speak on behalf of this initiative. We have uh, Chad Kusky. Kusky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a, a eighteen year Na Navy, Navy SEAL, SEAL. Yeah. and he had PTSD really bad. And uh, psilocybin, uh, one weekend with a psilocybin session, and he came away a different man. And so we really hope to is see there, this more work happening for veterans. Yeah, there's a great article in the Oregonian about Chad and Measure 109 and his support for it. If you want to look that up, it's really great stuff. Yeah. His name is Chad, the, the Navy SEAL. Yeah, and his last name is... K U S K E. Okay. K U S K E. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Looks like we've answered all the questions. Yeah, yeah we've had quite a long session here. This has been really interesting and uh, really helpful to folks to be able to speak, you know, speak to it with other people. Because some of us don't want to read a whole ballot measure, but we want to really hear what the core of it is and how how it all works. It also gives us all an idea of if you ever have an inspiration such as you have had and want to, to make change, what you have to go through to get that to happen. <laughs> That's a huge commitment and I really honor the work that you guys have done. This has been 
you know, a life has sort of taking over your life, like you said, a child has been. And I'm hoping that it's a, it's really successful and that, you know, I, I'm excited to see what's going to happen uh, for uh, so many people getting, becoming more aware of themselves and the world around us and how, you know, we've got these tools to, to make a difference and, hey, you know, these people. Well, isn't it, isn't it just incredible that it's a mushroom, you know, that mm -hmm. grows no, out of the not. ground? It's and so perfect. It, this, you're just talking to the wrong person. I mean, I'm way into the, you know, fungi is the future, you know, that the whole yeah. radical mycology thing, it's all yeah. on. You know. I hope you all saw Fantastic Fungi. We uh, screened that movie and uh, we actually had, did the world premiere of that movie. We worked with uh, really? Louis, Louis Schwartzberg. If you haven't seen that, go check out Fantastic Fungi. I'm sure we, you have. We did. We had it. Uh, we showed it. And uh, some of us have seen it more than once. So, yeah. so have we. We've seen it many times. It's yes, I'm sure you awesome. have. And it's right. It's right on target. So I, I, oh, I like I, how it. That was part of my, one of my missions is to be able to explain how fun, how important fungi is, how many things it does, and what they do in the world in so many ways. Um, this is just one more aspect of why fungi are critical to life on Earth. Isn't in it amazing? Many, many ways and in our lives and every living thing in fact and yeah. um you know i'm way into that that's my sort of my mission and my uh, my goal of being you know real active in, a, in our little local mushroom club because i want people to know this i mean to me it's like you know so under served i mean fungi are underserved you know they're not appreciated they're not understood um they're they're not embraced like they could be there's just there's another whole world you know pharmaceutical ways i mean the ways of healing in 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 natural ways uh the ways of you know all the things that paul samus talks about is you know far out as he goes and it which <laughs> like what you know <laughs> it's great because it's kind of the, the the making of science fiction and yet it's tr it's it's all yeah. based on yeah. What we have known in the past with fungi to do over time. We we have a long history of them. Um, yeah. And yeah, we sure do. Of us, if we, we thank thank you for your work, Linda, and thank you guys yeah. because you're opening minds and you're absolutely right that uh, just the interest in, in mycology and fungi just is a doorway into just all kinds of important things, including and our climate, including our own consciousness, is, is just uh, really inspiring. And I think people, once they get a door open to it and kind of step in, you know, that's what we found with our campaign is like, wow, a lot of people gravitated that we, we, we didn't know. It, and then it, it rang a, lot of, a little chime in that they're like, and because people know, I mean, there are some, you know, mushroom hunters that have, have discovered just what mushrooms can do for them, even just, you know, culinary wise. And then that just kind of goes, well, what are these things anyway? Yeah. And I'm eating them and, and they, they've been eating my foot and, you know, we're all in this together, including yeah. the mushrooms. So we, you know, I got to find, which was sort of one of the things that in, I had a fungus infection when I was a kid and I it really, you know, hurt my foot a lot. And I thought, that's really creepy. And then when I found mushrooms, I thought, how can that be the same thing, fungi? And I thought, all yeah. oh, the intertwining of, of my interaction with the fungi and then them in the world, it was, uh, it, it's been just a great journey and I love to continue it. And, and you just brought, out, brought it right out into the open of, of everyone that, you know, this is big, uh, a big help. This is huge medicine for so many people. Yeah. Boy, it sure is. It really is for so many people who have experienced real healing and real change. It's amazing. It's, it's beautiful. It's sacred. There's no better word for it than it's a sacred thing. And that's how we look at, at the world of, of the fantastic fungi. <laughs> that's right. Well, thank you very much guys. And I'm, you know, I'm good luck on everything and you have, all the support from certainly me and I think most all of us in the in the mushroom club if we have any educate any knowledge about this at all and we'll work all we can to try to keep people going and you know thank you we thank, thank you. you keep spreading the good word fingers crossed this all is right. a
This is it. Thank All you, right, guys. All right, guys. Thank you. Take we care. appreciate you so much. very much. Bye-bye.